Hi, everybody. Welcome back to 40 Days of Love. Now, the past several weeks, we've been looking at what love is according to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter in the Bible. And we've learned that love is patient, that love is kind, that love speaks the truth, that rejoices with the truth, and that love forgives. Now, the Bible also tells us that love is not self-seeking. And that's the next quality we're going to look at. Love is not selfish. You know, I recently went to the library to see what magazine articles I might find on self-centeredness. And I was surprised to find over 30 different topics under the category of self. Self-actualization, self-analysis, self-assertion, self-awareness, self-confidence, self-control, self-defense, self-expression, self-fulfillment, self-help, self-reliance, self-respect, and on and on and on and on. We are a very self-conscious society. And there's nothing new in that. God said back in Isaiah's day, they all turn to their own way and each seeks his own gain. You know, when I wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, I began it with the sentence, it's not about you. And that's the sentence that people tell me they remember because we live in a society that teaches the exact opposite of that. Uh, we're going to seed on self-seeking. It, it's all about me. And uh, really, that line was kind of a, a slap in the face. It was a refreshing reminder that there's more to life than just me. Now, if we're going to learn to be great lovers, the Bible says love isn't selfish. It isn't self-seeking. You can't be selfish and loving at the same time. In fact, selfishness is poison to relationships. Proverbs 28, 25 says, selfishness only causes trouble. Selfishness leaves us with superficial relationships at best. Uh, when I have no time for you, I've got no time for closeness. I'm too busy with my own goals, my own dreams, my own attitudes, my own career. And I certainly can't afford to let a relationship interfere with my career or my plans. And the result is we have very many lonely, lonely people in the world today. Now, how do we overcome this constant pull towards selfishness? Well, first, we have to build strong relationships. I remember when I first fell in love with Kay. You know, I have to admit that prior uh, to uh, that experience, basically all I thought about was myself. I was the typical, uh, you know, uh, self-centered young man. I thought about my dreams, my needs, my wishes, what I wanted to do. But when I fell in love with Kay, man, that focus changed really quick. And the only person I could think about was her. I don't even remember thinking about myself in those early days. It was, what can I do for her? How can I please her? How can I make her happy? What can I buy her? I was in love with her. And that's what love does. Love gets the focus off you and on to other people. It makes you a giver, not just a taker. One of the purposes of the church is to teach us to build relationships so we're not selfish. And that purpose is called fellowship. And in Ephesians 2.19, it says, you are a member of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. I want you to circle the word in your notes there, the word family. I believe that is one of the antidotes that we all need in living in a selfish society. We need a church family. We need a place where we can belong and become what God wants us to be. God never meant for us to be lone rangers. And when we don't have relationships, we get too busy for them, then all we can see is our own selves. And the best place to build relationships is in church, and the best place in church to build them is where you are right now in your small group. You know, Hebrews 10, 24 says this, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. Notice that getting together is to be a habit. It's one of the habits of the Christian life. We are to get together with other believers in the family of God, not just attend, but to participate, to share, to belong. We, we're to encourage each other. And that's why we need small groups. So people can know you and uh, you can get to know others. You know, in, in a large group, you can't really get to know everybody. But in a small group, you support each other, you help each other, you pray for each other, you encourage each other. Many of the things that God tells us to do in the New Testament can only be done in a small group. 
You know, there are 58 one another's in the New Testament. Love one another, care for one another, help one another. Where do you do those things? You don't do those in a worship service. You do them in a small group. The second thing that helps us develop unselfishness, because love is unselfish, is learning to give ourselves away. You must give yourself away intentionally in order to develop unselfishness in our lives. This is what real love is all about. And you do it by giving yourself away through some kind of service. Now, the Bible calls this ministry. Ministry and service are the same word in the Bible. It's the same Greek word. A minister is a servant. A servant is a minister. A ministry is service. And the relationship principles of Jesus that you read about uh, uh, this week uh, uh, was this principle of the greatest of the servants. And I'm convinced that to be spiritually and emotionally healthy and balanced, everybody needs some form of service on at least a weekly basis. You need to be in fellowship at least on a weekly basis, and you need to be in service on a weekly basis. These are two amazing antidotes to being self-centered. It's a place where you give yourself voluntarily away without receiving any personal benefit in return. It's a balance to our culture. You know, you have 168 hours uh, every week, and God doesn't want you to spend all of them on yourself. That you need to have a place of service where you say, at least part of my life, I'm going to give myself away. You know, little league coaching, caring for the sick, teaching children, community volunteers, uh, any of the multiple ministries in your church, or start a ministry. There's something you see that your church needs, and you know you can make that difference. That's one place that you're going to grow in love. Every time you serve, your heart grows bigger, and you need it for your spiritual health. Ephesians 2.10 says this, God has given us new lives from Christ and Jesus, and long ago he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Notice that last phrase, helping others. There are so many people who have an identity crisis today. They're going around going, who am I? Where am I? Uh, where am I going? Who, what am I supposed to be? Where did I come from? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? Well, it's very obvious. The Bible says, long ago he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. That's called ministry or service. And that's what God wants you to do with your life. It's one thing to talk about love. It's one thing to read about love. It's another thing to express love by serving other people in practical ways. And I want to tell you this, you're never going to find fulfillment in living for yourself. You only find fulfillment by giving your life away. Mark 8, 35 says this, Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to live. Jesus said that. If you're not giving your life away, you're not living. You're existing. The Bible says only those who give their lives away in service. In other words, for other people, know what it means to really live. Now, this is the exact opposite of what the world says. The world says, get all you can. And Jesus says the exact opposite, give all you can. And in giving, you understand what real life's all about. There's no greater fulfillment in giving your life away for the kingdom of God, for God's work, for helping others. You know, I know a lot of very wealthy people and a lot of very successful people. And yet, i found that those who only live for themselves are not fulfilled. They're not challenged. They're not feeling a meaning in their life. And they're saying, there's got to be something more. Well, there is. Because you were made for more than simply success. You were made for significance. And significance comes from service. Now, I, here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you, together as a small group, to... Make your plans for a ministry project together in your group time this week. I've hoped you've already started on this. We started talking about it uh, in week two of this study, uh, about having a, a project together, a service project together. See, this will bind you closer together than anything else. You can, you can study together and you can share together, but when you start serving together, it really binds you in love. And there's a third way to do that. Practice self-denial. That's the third thing. Build strong relationships, give yourself away, and the third one is practice self-denial because love 
is unselfish. Now, this isn't a very popular word, self-denial. Uh, most of us don't even want to talk about self-denial. Uh, we, we, we don't want to deny ourselves anything. But this is the way God builds love in our hearts. It's the third way. And here's how you do it. Every day, you need to find at least one opportunity where you can, at least one thing, that you can do the right thing, something out of conviction instead of out of convenience. And you do it for the good of other people. When you choose conviction over convenience, and when you choose to do the right thing rather than doing the easy thing, you are building love through self-denial. Every day, you need to find something where you can help others rather than just help yourself. The Bible says this in Philippians 2.4, look out for each other's interests, not just your own. The attitude you should have is the one Jesus Christ had. Now, I want you to circle the word look in that verse. You know, the, the Bible is originally written, the New Testament, in Greek. And the word for look in Greek is the word skopos, from which we get the word microscope, uh, telescope, stethoscope. It means to survey, to get a large view. And he's saying here, pay attention to the needs of those around you. We talked about this in a previous session. Be sensitive, be considerate. Pay attention to the needs of your husband, your wife, your children, your friends, the people you work with. Look out for other people's interests, not just your own. That's called self-denial. When you come home at night and you're tired and every bone in your body wants to flop down on the couch and turn on the TV and veg out, well, maybe what you need to do is instead go help with the dishes or do something else in the house that takes a little load off somebody else. You say, wait a minute, Rick. Are you telling me that self-denial means that I have to help do housework? Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Self-denial is worth nothing as a lofty idea. It only means something if you get out of your chair off of your blessed assurance and you go do something unselfish. Jesus said that what defines what a follower of Christ is, if anyone would come after me, he must, notice this, underline it, deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, when he says deny himself daily, that means it's got to be a daily habit. What about you? What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, you know, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding over this. Some people think to deny yourself means you go around putting yourself down all the time. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean going around saying, oh, I'm no good, I'm worthless, uh, I'm just a bunch of junk. Listen, you're not a bunch of junk. Jesus didn't die for junk. He died for people, and you are of extreme value. You are of extreme worth. You are of extreme significance. Just look at the cross. With his arms outstretched, Jesus says, I love you this much. And the very fact that he died for you shows you how valuable you are. Dying to self doesn't mean going around putting yourself down. So let me get specific what self-denial means. There's a list in your study guide, and uh, I want you to look at it. And as I go through it, I want to encourage you to put a check beside some of the areas where God is challenging you to grow right now as I just read through this. What does it really mean to deny yourself? Well, let's look at this. When you can watch other people prosper and, and succeed without feeling jealous, but rather rejoice in their success, then you know the meaning of denying yourself. When you see other people's needs being met with abundance while your needs are far greater and you don't question God or you don't fail to be grateful for what you do have, that's denying yourself. Or when you choose to serve your wife or your husband or your children or anyone else and you put their needs ahead of your own, that's denying yourself. Or how about this one? When you share your faith at work or at school or in your neighborhood, knowing that you may be insulted or put down, that's denying yourself. Then when you don't seek praise and you don't fish for compliments and you don't need the approval of other people and when you can live without constantly being recognized and applauded, that's denying yourself. Here's another one. 
When you draw out of the other person in conversation, you draw them out, rather than telling your own stories and opinions, that's denying yourself. When you can accept criticism willingly, and you can learn from that criticism with a teachable attitude, that is denying yourself. And then when you can be content with less than the best of circumstances, without griping or complaining, when you can accept interruptions that God places in your schedule and you patiently endure irritations, guess what? You are denying yourself. These are all aspects of a deeper level of love and maturity. Again, Jesus said, only those who throw their lives away for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Unselfishness is not a good way to live. It's the only way to live. Learning to live lovingly is not a good way to live. It's the only way to live. Now, I'd like to ask you to hold hands together around your group as we pray. And I'm going to ask you to choose to make these three unselfish decisions with me. This is a deeper level of love than the world ever teaches. The world teaches love is all about me. What am I going to get out of it? But this is the love that the Father has for you and that Jesus demonstrated for you and that the Holy Spirit wants to put through you. So let's bow our heads right now. Dear God, we want to start building and keeping strong relationships. And we know that we need people in our lives to give us balance. We know that in a society that says, think only of yourself, that we need to think of others. So we pray this prayer together today. Now you pray. Say, Jesus, I want to learn to be unselfish. I want to grow more unselfish every single day by building deeper relationships, by practicing self-denial, by giving my life away in service. Help me to find some place where I can, on a regular basis, voluntarily do something that I don't receive any benefit from, that I don't receive back from. Lord, I don't have the time for this. But you know, even as I say that, it is an evidence that my perspective is wrong. I want to make time to learn to be loving by being unselfish, by being a servant, by meeting the needs of other people. I know you did not put me on this planet just to serve myself. So Jesus, show me how to practice self-denial. Show me ways in my life, little ways that nobody will ever see, where I can be loving and unselfish. Show me the moments and the opportunities where I can choose to take up the cross and follow you. And help us as a group to find a project that we could do together that would develop the serving muscles in our lives, that our souls would be strengthened, and that our hearts would be enlarged as we learn the lessons of love. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I want to thank you again for staying with us. We've got another week coming together, but I want you to enjoy your discussion uh, in this session. And I'm praying that you will come up with a service project, a ministry project in your church, uh, in your community, that you can do even this week. And I'll see you back next week for our final study together in 40 Days of Love. God bless you.